Okay. Great. Lovely to see all these faces. And thank you so much, everyone, for having your work computers on mute. We're all getting very savvy in this, this day and age with what we how we behave on Zoom. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, tēnā koutou and welcome to this Fulbright New Zealand Good Works presentation for June. Um, my name is Therese Lloyd and I'm the Senior Communications Advisor here at Fulbright New Zealand. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We are really, really delighted and thrilled to have Olivia Truex, who is today beaming in from North Carolina. Um, welcome, Olivia. So Olivia received a Fulbright US Graduate Award in 2017 to complete her Master's in Geology at Otago University here in New Zealand, and she's now moved on to do her PhD also at Otago. Um, today she's going to be talking about how the Antarctic ice sheets are changing with climate and what this means for Aotearoa New Zealand. She will discuss her research, reconstructing past climates, and how solving the mysteries of the past will help us to better predict and prepare for the future. So without further ado, I will welcome Olivia. Thanks. Hi everyone, thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you all for joining me. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So, um, good afternoon, I guess, for me it's evening. Um, and welcome, today I'm gonna be giving a talk entitled Past is Prologue, Antarctica in a Warming World. Um, and jumping right in, I guess I'm really aiming to accomplish three goals. The first is to talk to you today about how the ocean around Antarctica responds to and drives global climate change. I'm going to chat about what we know and all that we don't know about the future of the Antarctic ice sheets in a changing climate. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my research and how the response of ice sheets to past intervals of warming can help us better predict and understand the future. So to start off, what is an ice sheet. So an ice sheet forms in an area of the world where snow persists all summer. And so over time, as different layers of snow fall and build up, um, they eventually uh, grow so thick that the gravitational force of the snow compacts the underlying snow into ice. And as this ice responds to gravity, it flows. And in regions of the world where it's cold enough, this ice will flow until it reach, reaches the sea. And currently we have two regions of the world that are that cold, Greenland and Antarctica. Um, so Greenland and Antarctica have some important similarities and they also have some important differences. Um, one is that in Greenland, you might run into a polar bear who will mess with your science equipment. Um, and we don't have that problem in Antarctica. But probably more salient for my talk is that the Greenland ice sheet is much smaller. It includes seven and a half meters of sea level, and it also is much warmer. So over the summer, temperatures in Greenland rise above freezing. And that means that in the lower parts of the ice sheet, um, they'll actually start to melt on the surface and melt from the ice sheet will flow into the ocean. Antarctica is a bit different. We have penguins, which are far cuter and don't mess with your equipment, but do smell really bad. <laughs> um, and more salient for my talk, um, Antarctica is much larger. So currently 60 meters of sea level are locked up in the Antarctic ice sheets. And um, in Antarctica, it's also cold year round. So snow accumulates across the entire top of the ice sheet. And though sometimes temperatures will rise above freezing, in general, the snow will persist even at sea level over summer. And this means that when the ice reaches the coast, it flows into the ocean. And the moment at which the ice starts floating, we start to call it an ice shelf. Um, and ice shelves lose mass in two primary ways. The first is iceberg calving. Um, some of you may have seen the news recently about the giant icebergs the size of Majorca coming off of the um, Atlantic sector of the ice sheet, or maybe just me. <laughs> um, and as well, the other way that ice shelves lose mass is through subglacial melting. So slightly warmer ocean waters come in contact with the bottom of the ice. And though the air is so cold that the, the top isn't really melting, the bottom will melt because of these warmer waters. And so these kind of two different um, natures of the Greenland versus the Antarctic ice sheet are really important when we think about their response to global climate change. 
So as temperatures are rising in Greenland, that means that summer temperatures are getting warmer and warmer, driving increased melt happening on top of the ice sheet. In Antarctica, it is getting warmer, but it's not really getting warm enough to melt the ice sheet in the summer. However, climate change is driving changes in ocean circulation, which are bringing warmer waters into contact with the environment under the ice shelf. And this is causing an increase in subglacial melting. So this means that Greenland um, is quite a lot easier to study than Antarctica, because you can, you can kind of take a lot of the important measurements from on top. In Antarctica, you have to go underneath and you have to consider the interaction between the ocean and the ice sheet. So here I'm zooming in on another ice sheet diagram. So here, here's the ice sheet and it's flowing um, past the grounding line where it's the point where it starts to float. And this is a schematic of the warmer water mass coming into contact below the ice shelf. And I say warmer because it is definitely not warm. Um, my supervisors were always on me when I started my uh, master's not to call it warm water because circumpolar deep water is two degrees Celsius. So definitely not somewhere you'd want to swim, but it's quite a lot warmer than the overlying surface water um, in Antarctica, which is about negative two. And as, um, as climate is changing and temperatures are increasing, this warm water mass is both warming and also moving closer to the ice shelf. And as it circulates below, it's causing this melting to happen under the ice shelf. Okay, so I've just thrown quite a bit at you for any who are not enmeshed in Antarctic science. And so I thought I would recap. So we have change in climate, changing ocean circulation, which is melting the Antarctic ice sheets primarily from below. And all that melting ice has to go somewhere it's going into the ocean and causing sea level rise. And so far, global mean sea level has risen between 21 and 24 centimeters since um, we start having reliable measurements in about 1880. Um, however, the majority of that was in the last 20 years. So Antarctica and Greenland are losing mass. This meltwater is going into the ocean um, and it's happening more and more quickly. It's accelerating in the last 20 years. So, what does that mean for our future? How much will sea level rise? So I've introduced this kind of um, intense graph because I wanna underline a couple of really important points about sea level rise. So on the left, um, I have sea level contribution in centimeters sea level equivalent. This is from both Antarctica and Greenland. And we're over here in 2021. And as we go out to the year 2100, all of these different brightly colored lines represent different climate features that we as a global community could choose based on how much we cut our emissions. So over here in green is a kind of drastic emissions reduction. It's a world that we where we keep warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And these various scenarios ramp up to red, um, where we really don't do anything about our emissions. And um, where we can expect warming about, of about four degrees Celsius. Um, and so these projections at the bottom are the main projections and they include kind of all of the ice sheet processes that we as an Antarctic community and Greenland, Greenland studying community are pretty sure are happening. These are things that are well-documented. We've known about them for years. We've put them in the ice sheet models. People have compared them and there's a lot of consensus around this. These different projections up here, or the risk averse for Antarctica projections, are projections that incorporate some aspects of the Antarctic ice sheet that we're not yet totally sure about, but could lead to um, increased instability. So these are, these are processes like ice cliff collapse that we're not totally sure on the physics yet. It's been observed in a couple places, and we are not quite yet ready as a scientific community to say, yes, this is absolutely gonna happen. But it's important to take them into account when we're thinking about the kind of whole range of possible features that we could expect. Um, so if we just zoom in on the green, which is the 1.5 degree and the red, which is the four degree, a general pro tip for all Antarctic science, red is going to be bad. <laughs> um, but if we zoom in on these two and if we combine the uncertainties from the main projections and the risk averse for Antarctic projections for both of them, 
we get a pretty large range of possible sea level contribution from the ice sheets. So if we manage to really come together as a global community and limit our warming to 1.5 degrees, we can expect anywhere from about zero to about 55 centimeters of sea level rise, which if you're, if you're planning for a coastal community is a really big difference. Um, four degrees Celsius, we're, lo we're definitely locked in to over tw about 20 centimeters of sea level rise, but it could go as high as 80. And so the thing that I really wanna underscore here is regardless of emissions pathway, future sea level rise is very uncertain. Um, there's a lot we don't yet know about how these ice sheets operate, um, but that's not a reason to discount the projections. In fact, precisely the opposite, that as we learn more, these projections tend to grow higher. So um, the uncertainty shouldn't make us feel comfortable. <laughs> it should kind of motivate us to do more research and in the meantime, really cut our emissions. Um, so I'm going to put in a brief plug for coastalclimatecentral.org. It's a great web app that lets you explore what the range of possible sea level rise would mean for your community. So here I'm showing my community in Dunedin. Um, and yeah, I highly suggest having a play, sharing it with the folks in your life. Okay, so to recap again of where I've gone so far, we have changing climate, changing ocean circulation, melting ice, leading to sea level rise. Um, and I guess one thing that I forgot to say at the beginning is that I'm gonna be pausing periodically to take a sip of water and gather myself. Um, and I thought I would also use these opportunities to have a look at the chat. So if, as I'm talking, you ever have a question, I'm covering a lot of ground. Um, I'm, I'll be pausing every so often and having a look at the chat and would happy, be happy to take a shot at answering them because I'm super excited to hear any of your thoughts or questions as I go along. So with that, I'm definitely gonna have some water. Okay, so we've so we've gone through gone through so far to sea level rise, but the tricky thing about the climate system is things are never quite as neat as my set of arrows might imply. And for it, for us in our problem that we're talking about today, um, it gets even more complex because melting ice is changing ocean circulation. And <clears throat> to give an example of this, I'm going to show a video that has an ice cube of dyed water melting in fresh water on the left and in salt water on the right. And what I want you to notice is that as this fresh water dyed ice cube melts, the cold water sinks and it mixes through the water column, in this case being a glass. On the right, the ice cube that's melting in salt water, even though the ice cube is cold, the water as it, as it melts, the fresh water is less dense than the salt water underneath it. And so it's forming this little lid on top of the water glass. And so if you think about an ice sheet melting, ice sheets are fresh, and as they melt into the salty ocean, they too have the potential to form this kind of low salinity cap on top of it, just like the glasses in our little demo. And Unfortunately for us, um, really in the last five years, folks have started to do research on this. And what they found is that as the ice sheet melts, this ice melt goes out into the ocean and this freshwater cap actually prevents the upwelling warm water, the circumpolar deep water that I talked about earlier. It prevents it from upwelling and redirects it towards the continent in Antarctica, which kind of further brings it closer to the ice sheet, which further melts the ice, which um, has the potential to add to sea level rise and in turn further change ocean circulation. So the technical term for this is the, a positive feedback and the kind of colloquial term for this is a massive bummer and an uncertainty that we had for a while that does not look like it's breaking in our favor and would mean that we're really potentially pushing us up towards those higher end projections from the ice sheet models in terms of this level of sea level rise that we could expect. And if you thought that that wasn't complicated enough, this changing ocean circulation is also changing climate. And um, to kind of 
give an intro to that, I'm going to talk very briefly about the way that the ocean ocean circulation around Antarctica works. And I put this map up, which is a map of global ocean circulation from the perspective of the world ocean. And I showed this to my mom when I was preparing for the talk and she was really spooked by it. So <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go through with the recognition that some of you don't spend all of your time looking at polar projections of Antarctica. So we have Antarctica in the center um, and South America is over here. North America, I'm over here in North Carolina is actually split down the middle. So we have half over here and half over here, Europe and Africa. New Zealand gets a kind of very light smudge, um, but it is included. Um, and at the center of this map is Antarctica. And I really like this map because it highlights the connectivity of the global ocean. So some of you might have been introduced to global ocean circulation using a graphic kind of like this, which is just, um, kind of showing our understanding of the way the ocean circulates in the context of maps that we're used to looking at. But what I really like about this map is that by flipping our perspective to look at it from the ocean, we can see the central role that Antarctica, which is relegated to the bottom down here, actually plays in the global ocean. So um, the red arrows in this map are um, warmer surface currents and the blue arrows are deeper currents. So as the water as the water travels around, it sinks near the poles, both in Antarctica and in Greenland and forms the deep arm, which comes back around and upwells around the coast. That's the circumpolar deep water that I was talking to you about earlier and then sinks again. And this is all um, a bit abstract. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share a brief video that I absolutely love that provides a bit of a visualization of the way that this kind of upwelling, downwelling, and circulation of the ocean actually takes place. It does have sound. It just takes a sec. The Southern Ocean is home to the world's strongest and deepest currents that control the circulation of seawater across the entire world ocean. A key driver of this circulation is the decrease in sea surface temperature seen here in purple, with freezing conditions close to the Antarctic coast producing seasonal sea ice. Salt is rejected from the sea ice as it forms, leaving the remaining seawater salty, cold and therefore very dense. Away from the coast, circulation is influenced by the speed of different surface features like eddies and jets. Scientists better understand and ocean circulation by looking beneath the surface to the ocean's interior. Taking layers of constant density, known as isopycnals, we observe where the densest water sinks and then spreads across the very bottom of the world ocean. Antarctic bottom water is very dense water formed by freezing conditions on the Antarctic continental shelf in places such as the Weddell Sea. As the sea ice forms, it produces dense shelf water beneath the ice, which then cascades over the continental shelf and into the ocean's abyss. Similar processes are occurring all around Antarctica. The energetic currents and features of the surface ocean hide pools of dense, deep water slowly moving along the ocean floor. The Ross Sea is another region where waterfalls of dense shelf water are continually feeding the bottom of the ocean. As this water cascades downward, it is pushed westward by the Earth's rotation and mixes with surrounding waters that are warmer and less salty and therefore less dense. So properties of bottom water vary around Antarctica due to changes in local winds, heating, precipitation and the ice conditions where they are formed. Away from the coastline, deep jet-like currents can be seen, mirroring the dynamic surface features observed in the water above. The energy from circulating flow structures, such as eddies and vortices, plays an important role in maintaining the broader dynamics of Southern Ocean circulation. A more complete picture of the ocean structure is observed by stacking density layers on top of one another. These layers tend to angle toward the surface in the south, whereas strong eddies create hills or depressions in the layer, depending on the direction they rotate. Although strongest at the surface, where winds help to drive the flow, these eddies extend to the abyss, 
and help pump deep water back up to the surface. While eddies are found throughout the Southern Ocean, there are particular hotspots of activity that are usually controlled by topographic features and islands. Off the tip of Southern Africa, currents interact with topography to generate a train of agullus rings which propagate into the Atlantic. Much remains to be learned about the Southern Ocean. Observations combined with increasingly powerful models continue to yield new insight into this inaccessible part of the world. I love watching the different currents ripple out of the Ross Sea. Um, so that's kind of a transition to um, here. I've zoomed in on a satellite photo of the Ross Sea. It's this southwestern Ross Sea. It's this red box right down here. Um, you are mostly down here in New Zealand. Um, and what this satellite photo is showing is so here we have the ice, the Ross ice shelf here and um, East Antarctic, the East Antarctic, Transantarctic Antarctic Mountains here. The white here is all sea ice and the dark black is open water. And so in, in the video, they talk about how as sea ice forms, the um, salt rejected from the sea ice sinks and it kind of forms this Antarctic bottom water that you saw in the cascading um, plumes going out of the Ross Sea. And so these bits of open water um, are kept open by really high winds that push the sea ice off, off the coast. So the sea ice continually forms, um, rejects this salt, which sinks, but then the sea ice is pushed away. So it's kind of a continuous process that can happen. Um, and so I'm gonna show another video um, that kind of gives a little bit more insight into the um, kind of sinking of dense water from sea ice. Also, I love this video, so. New sea ice swarming above leaves behind brine that is so extremely salty it sinks rapidly. As it descends, the seawater around it freezes instantly and forms a sheath of ice, a brinicle that grows downwards towards the sea floor. Winter is reaching down from the cold world above. As it touches the sea floor, it kills whatever living thing it contacts by encasing it in a tomb of ice. Even in the relative warmth of the water, the lethal cold of winter threatens life on the seafloor. So I have to add the caveat that most dense water in Antarctica is not formed in brinicles. I do not want to leave you with the impression of these kind of <laughs> icy fingers of death being an underpin of our global ocean circulation. But I guess I really wanted to show you that video because I thought if you forgot everything from this talk, you would probably remember Icy Barnacles of Death because um, I saw it as a freshman in college almost 10 years ago now and it stuck with me. So uh, I hope it will stick with you. Okay. So after a bit of a digression into the world of ocean circulation and the very important role of Antarctica in, and the Southern Ocean in helping to drive ocean circulation and talking a bit about how important different density layers are in this process and therefore the pretty big impact that dumping a bunch of fresh water into that sensitive um, density driven salty system is. 
we get to the, we return to our main question, um, which is how is Antarctic meltwater changing global climate? And I'm happy to report that for any of you that have seen the 2004 blockbuster Day After Tomorrow, um, which is ex premised on exactly this question, um, it is nothing quite so dramatic as all of New York freezing over in a matter of days. So here I'm showing global mean surface air temperature, which is an anomaly from the um, pre-industrial mean, or the, um, not the pre-industrial mean, uh, the 21st, 20th century mean. And I'm showing it for two different model runs. Um, one is a model that doesn't include any feedbacks associated with meltwater from the Antarctic ice sheets. And the blue is a model that takes into account, it adds a bunch of meltwater associated with retreating Antarctic ice sheets into the model to see what happens and how global temperature changes. And so um, we're here in the early 2000s. And as you can see, pretty immediately, there is a difference between the model that includes the meltwater feedback and the model that doesn't include the meltwater feedback. And the model with meltwater actually delays some of the warming that we see um, in this projection. And that is kind of good news. So um, it does mean that potentially some of the worst effects of heating might be a little bit delayed once models routinely incorporate the impact of melting ice sheets. But what this study also found is that um, this meltwater also has, makes big changes in global precipitation. So here I'm showing the 2080 to 2100 average daily precipitation. And it's an anomaly plot between the model that includes a meltwater feedback and the model that doesn't include a meltwater feedback. And what, we, what I want to highlight in this plot is that um, you know, half a millimeter of rain a day might not sound like a lot, but on the scale of a year, and if you're trying to grow crops in Papua New Guinea and other parts of the Southwest Pacific, that's a really different amount of rain. And if our models don't routinely incorporate this Antarctic meltwater feedback, which currently very few of them do, regions, as we, as we plan and plan to adapt to climate change, this not including this feedback can have really big impacts on our ability to plan for things like crops. I mean, for, for example, Australia and the northern part of New Zealand in these projections that include meltwater are a lot drier, which has really big policy implications. Um, and so is something that we need to work to better incorporate into our model simulations. And of course, changing climate is further changing ocean circulation to fully complete my loop. Um, so I've taken you on a bit of a whirlwind tour through 2004, uh, bad 2004 movies and the real life version. And I thought I would pause for a second to answer a couple questions that have come up in the chat. Um, Richard asked if, how does my research tie into planetary boundaries? And um, that's not something that I've been researching specifically, but I'd be super interested to learn more about it. Um, and Jane Thrailkill, says that the traditional world map breaks up ocean flow, whereas the map with Antarctica in the middle makes it clear that all the oceans are connected, though it's confusing. Um, I definitely think that kids should learn the second kind of map. Um, I think it shifts our perspective in a really important way um, and highlights some of the limitations of trying to study the Earth system from a kind of purely northern hemisphere perspective, which I think a lot of us do. Um, so with that, I will continue um, and shift gears a bit to um, grapple with, so I've laid out a lot of uncertainties. I've laid out uncertainties in our sea level rise projections. I've laid out uncertainties associated with some of these feedbacks. Um, so what can we do to actually address this? I don't, I don't wanna leave you with this sense that um, Antarctica makes the future unknowable. Um, and so one of the first things we can do is develop fully coupled model simulations. So the, and that basically just means having bigger supercomputers um, or taking the big supercomputers that we already have and allocating them towards this problem of uh, future climate. So most of the sea level rise projections that I showed you earlier are done with a climate model, which is then coupled in kind of one direction to an ice sheet model. So the climate model talks to the ice sheet model to say climate is warming, the ocean around you is warming, 
but the ice sheet model can't talk back to the climate model. Some of this other work that I've shared with you about the impact of melting ice on changing climate and changing ocean circulation, that goes in the other direction. Um, so we have an ice sheet model, which is talking to a climate model. And really in an ideal world, we would have this all working together. Um, and yeah, this is just a problem of allocating more computer resources. I uh, was talking to my mom about this and she made the suggestion that maybe we should use some of the computer power we currently spend on Bitcoin and reallocate it to this because I've been complaining to her about the energy use of Bitcoin. So I think that's a great policy proposal. Um, so, but there, there's a couple other stuff we can do besides just having better supercomputers. Um, Another important thing is having more present day observations. So here I'm showing a old photo of the crew of the Endeavor trying to chip their boat out of the ice when Scott got trapped. And we've come a really long way in terms of our ability to predict sea ice trends. Um, had they had this crew gone on any other year, they wouldn't have gotten stuck in the ice, but they didn't know enough about the trends back then. Um, and we've also come a long way since Scott in terms of our equipment. So we have obviously much better ships these days that can break through the ice um, and allow us to better study the system. But Antarctica remains a really inhospitable place. And in particular, studying this region under the ice shelf is incredibly hard. And despite its kind of global importance, because we know that we have um, warm water coming under and threatening the ice shelves, these ice shelves are some of the least understood places on Earth. We have more measurements from the surface of the moon than we do from some of the ice shelves in Antarctica that um, kind of have global importance in terms of their potential ability to um, impact climate and sea level. And so finally, we can also use geologic records of past climate. And this is my wheelhouse, and this is really where my research is focused. So um, in this plot, I'm showing surface temperature, um, anomaly from the pre-industrial mean, which is marked right here. And on the right, we have different climate projections for different emission scenarios. So in red, we have a really high emission scenarios where we don't reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. In the light blue, we somewhat reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And in the blue, we have dramatic reductions. And, um, and then over to the left, we're looking at how those projected surface temperature trends compare to much of geologic time. And one thing I really want to highlight here is the way that this scale is changing. So over here, we're measuring things in years. Back in this part of the plot, we're measuring things in kilo years before present or thousands of years. So um, we've got the Holocene, which was generally about the same temperature that we were. It cools into the last glacial maximum, which is about 20,000 years ago. And then we make another jump. And so now we're looking at thousands of years and we can see the last sets of glacials and interglacials. And then we move even farther back into the Pliocene where we're measuring things in millions of years before present. And then finally into the Miocene um, where we're measuring things in twenties of millions of years before present. And so currently where we are, the closest geologic analog to the amount of temperature change that we've inflicted is the mid Pliocene. And over the past 20 years, we've just been working our way backwards through the Pliocene, which is really quite a lot of ground to cover in uh, tens of years when the Pliocene was millions of years. Um, and so what we can use records from the Pliocene for these days is to understand kind of where we might be headed towards as our system comes into equilibrium. So over here on this side, I'm showing a comparison of sea level today um, to sea level in the Pliocene. And so here we are today, um, 2021, we have CO2 of about 420 parts per million, up from 280 parts per million in 1890. And back in the Pliocene, um, they also had uh, CO2 of about 400 parts per million. However, sea level was over six meters higher and temperatures were two to three degrees warmer than today. And so one thing you might have noticed is that earlier when I was talking about sea level rise projections, um, I was talking about 
um, I was talking about centimeters and now I'm telling you about meters and talking, saying that the last time that climate was this warm, we had meters more sea level. And with major contributions from Greenland, potentially all of Greenland melted and um, some contribution from the Antarctic ice sheets. So the important thing here is that we are not a system in equilibrium. So the, um, we are making such rapid change that um, it's hard, and it kind of, it matters quite a bit how long it takes a system to equilibrate. So if we think back to that geologic timescale, if, if, if equilibrium means that we're gonna lose all of Greenland and Antarctica, but that process takes millions of years, that is much less of a policy consideration than if it takes kind of decades or hundreds of years. So we can kind of look to the deep time for these analogs, but they won't necessarily tell us anything about rate. Um, and for that, we really want to zoom in on this period from the of the last 20,000 years. So going from the last glacial maximum when we had ice sheets covering much of the northern hemisphere, sea level was much, much lower than it is today. And looking at this transition from the last glacial maximum into the into our kind of current Holocene interglacial kind of gives us an opportunity to say like, how does an ice sheet respond to a warming world? With the caveat that the um, CO2 jump was much smaller. And so it's potentially not a perfect analog in some ways. That being said, um, uh, we're gonna zoom in and take a closer look at this time period because this is really where my research is focused. So starting our story, 18, about 18,000 years ago, temperatures are much colder, potentially about six degrees colder globally. And um, over here, I'm showing a map of New Zealand. And in blue, we have the extent of glaciation. So this period about 18,000 years ago, much of the Southern Alps are covered in glaciers. And so what I'm interested in, um, in my research, is how did the Antarctic ice sheets respond during this period of warming? So as we're going from six degrees colder to kind of our present or pre-industrial temperature, what were the Antarctic ice sheets doing and how can that process of warming help us understand what might happen in the future? So um, 18,000 years ago, um, we have the, we've, we've gone back to the Ross Sea now, um, which is my stomping grounds. And so 18,000 years ago, we have an ice sheet filling the entirety of the Ross Sea. And this is kind of a kind of north-south schematic cartoon that shows um, an ice sheet and it's kind of just poking off the continental shelf. And so somehow um, over the course of the last 20,000 years, we got from there to here, which is kind of a modern, much smaller ice shelf. Um, we have a much larger continental shelf area where all that important dense water is produced. Um, and so what can we do to kind of constrain how this is happening? And luckily there are a bunch of wonderful New Zealanders on it. Um, so this is a whole set of folks who are in New Zealand and have worked on this in this area from a variety of different methods. My supervisor, Christina Rieselman, Rebecca Parker, who did much of the work that underlies my work now, Jamie Stutz and Ross Whitmore, who are working on land, looking at glaciers, and Rob Mackay, who's been also thinking in this period about how the Ross Sea's changed. And so all of these wonderful people have put together a set of proxy records that really suggests that the majority of this transition from ice sheet filling the Ross Sea to kind of modern ice sheet is happening in this period from about 15,000 years ago to 4,000 years ago, with a really rapid period of retreat happening kind of more in this 6,000 year period. Um, and this is interesting, very good. Um, but the problem comes when we try to compare this to our ice sheet models. So this is Dan Lowry, an ice sheet modeler at GNS. And what he's found when he runs an ice sheet model to try to recreate this is that the retreat is happening a lot earlier. And so this is kind of a puzzle, like what is going on that is potentially delaying ice sheet retreat that we're not resolving in the model. And it's a potentially kind of heartening puzzle because it suggests that maybe there are some feedbacks in the system that we don't yet fully have a handle on that might actually be, might actually protect the ice shelf from these warmer waters or maybe buy us a little bit more time and sea level rise. So this was the problem that I was really interested in digging into for my PhD. This is what, this is where the masters snowballed <laughs> into the PhD project. Um, so my way into this as a geologist is through sediment cores. So 
Um, these red dots are highlighting the locations of three sediment cores collected by Rebecca Parker and Christina Rieselman in the southwestern Ross Sea back in 2015. Um, this is a photo of me not on that voyage, on a different voyage, but I wanted to show it to highlight what a kind of sediment core catcher looks like. So what we do is we kind of drop these tubes off the boat, and as they sink into the sediment on the seafloor, um, you kind of can deploy a little bottom to capture it. And when you bring it up, you have a kind of sequence of sediment that records past, past changes that that sediment saw. And so what I was interested in doing um, is looking to see how those changes in past sediment can help you understand ice sheet retreat and then ocean, ocean changes after ice sheet retreat. So this is that same schematic again. These kind of black dots highlight the kind of imagined location of some sediment cores. And what these cores show, what Rebecca Parker and then more work that I've done show is that more than 6,500 years ago, this whole area in the southwestern Ross Sea was covered with ice. Between uh, um, <laughs> 6,500 years ago and 4,000 years ago, um, the grounding line or kind of that point where the ice, um, the ice is grounded retreated over the core sites. But what I found in the sedimentary record is evidence that there was persistent sea ice across this whole period between um, for this, this whole kind of 2,500 year period. And then after about 4,000 years ago, we get the onset of conditions that look more modern. Um, so I had the question of could meltwater produced sea ice actually be protecting the Ross ice shelf from warmer ocean temperatures? Maybe all of this meltwater is pouring off. It's kind of forming this cap on the ocean, but for, and it's freezing into sea ice. And maybe in this region of the Ross Sea, because of kind of local feedbacks that might not be resolved in these global models that suggests that meltwater only ever warms the underside of ice shelves, maybe in this region that could be a stabilizing factor. And because Dan's model doesn't include that, he could be getting retreat much earlier. Um, and so maybe if we ran models again with this feedback, we could maybe resolve the discrepancy. So I approached Dan and Elena, a ocean modeler at NIWA with this geologic hypothesis. And so here I'm showing a schematic of Dan's ice sheet model, which um, shows the retreat of the grounding line. Um, so that point where the uh, ice sheet lifts off from the ocean and starts to float through time. And what Elena has is a much better ocean model than these kind of larger scale models I was talking about. So it just, it includes an ice shelf cavity, which a lot of these models don't. And basically it's just generally much, it's much finer scale. Um, so I sold them the, on this idea <laughs> and they didn't tell me that I was a crazy geologist. Um, and so we decided to run some model simulations. And the first thing we found when we looked at Dan's model of what's actually driving the retreat of the ice shelf um, is that icebergs play a huge role in my kind of conceptual model and in the way that most people have been thinking about the retreat from the LGM. Um, it's really been a story that's been dominated by meltwater, this kind of like, you know, uh, the kind of ice cube sitting, sitting and melting. Um, version. But what Dan's model is saying is like, no, actually it's big icebergs breaking off. And so here I'm showing the recent stuff article with the giant iceberg, because these icebergs, when I say big, I mean like Manhattan or Mallorca size, they're huge. Um, so I, I, we've amended our hypothesis to say, could meltwater produce sea ice and really big icebergs protect the Ross ice shelf from warmer ocean temperatures? Because these icebergs, they really disrupt things. Like um, in, in the early 2000s, uh, there was a, a major iceberg calved off the Ross and it totally disrupted sea ice dynamics. And I don't wanna leave you hanging, but the answer is that we don't know yet. Um, the models are running, my PhD is still in progress. Um, but if you get back to me in a couple months, I might be able to answer this question. So to kind of wrap everything up, um, I've told you today that changing climate is changing ocean circulation, is melting ice, is leading to sea level rise. 
and that unfortunately this melting ice is further changing ocean circulation and global climate models suggest that this initiates a positive feedback because it caps the warm water. This suggests that maybe sea level rise projections should be much higher. Changing ocean circulation is also changing climate and that has big implications and should be included in our models if we, um, because we know that the ice sheets are melting. So we need to include this meltwater to be able to um, rigorously predict the changes in climate. Um, the past has a really important, uh, is a really important source of data to help us solve this problem, both looking into the deep past that helps give us an idea of the steady state we might be headed to. Um, to me, this, this graphic is really probably one of the most compelling reasons that we need to act on climate change, because it really shows that a system in equilibrium at 400 parts per million is a really, really different world than the world that we live in. And there's a lot of uncertainty as to how we're going to get there. Um, but we have a pretty clear picture of where we're going. Um, and my little piece of this big puzzle is trying to reduce a little bit of that uncertainty into how we're going to get there through um, by better understanding the past and understanding how in the past ice melt and really big icebergs um, might have potentially might potentially buy us a little bit more time in terms of the retreat of the ice sheets. And so yeah, the, the bottom line that I really want to hit home is that the most productive way to reduce our uncertainties is to reduce our emissions. Um, scientists like me and many of you are going to keep working on this. Um, but at the end of the day, we kind of we know where we're heading and we know that it's really different than the climate that has helped us thrive. Um, I just want to end uh, by returning to this map of the world from the perspective of the global ocean. Um, I think I like this map so much because it's a little bit unsettling. It takes the perspective of the world that I grew up with, a world that prioritizes land masses in the northern hemisphere and the people who live there, and it flips it on its head. And once I sit with the strangeness of it, I love that it shows how a Northern Hemisphere Western perspective on the world might limit our understanding of a globally connected world ocean and our place within it. Um, Aotearoa's connection to Antarctica began through the ocean. Recent work by Silla Wehi and colleagues describes Maori oral histories that date the earliest sightings of Antarctica to Hui to Rangiora and his crew in the seventh century. And despite those deep roots and really exciting recent work that's incorporating Mautadanga and a Maori perspective, Antarctic and Southern Ocean research today is dominated by Pakiha and foreigners like me. And we know that like a map of the world that centers the Northern Hemisphere land masses, research conducted primarily from the world of Pakiha limits our understandings and to truly understand the role of Antarctica in a changing world and what that means for Aotearoa, we need to better prioritize Maori and Pacific perspectives in this research. Um, and I'm early in my career, I'm still figuring out how to do that, but it's really exciting to have so many wonderful people to learn from in this space. And with that, I'd like to say a big thanks to Fulbright and Zed for setting me on the path to do this research all those years ago. I was realizing that I, if I applied to come do this master's um, almost six years ago now, which is a little mind boggling. Um, and I'd also like to say a big thanks to for my supervisors and collaborators and the funders, all of whom have made this work possible. So thank you all so much for listening. And I've gone a little bit over the time that I stated, but I'm happy to answer any other questions.